Welcome to one and all. Hope all of you are enjoying the sessions and obtaining knowledge too. And um, what is your feel? You're all halfway through. Um, so, and one more thing, what I would like to add on is, you've all got the book. As you go by, keep uh, reading that, at least cover up to the topics that you've done so far which will be very, very handy for your exam point of view. So that also is part and parcel of it. So that is one thing I would like to convey because don't keep it for the last minute because if you do it as and when, and you have some questions and all types of information along with each chapter itself in it. So what I'm mentioning is that primer book, okay? So that is something which will be handy for you through the course and uh, hope all of you are um, enjoying the uh, sessions uh, as they are going on. Anything, any information or uh, someone would like to ask or clarify something, please do. Okay. Dr. Yeah, Sam, so I just got the message that um, from Dr. Josephine that she'll be joining in, in a few minutes. Hmm. So, uh, if Dr. Pooja Ganesh is also available, would you like to take the case presentation first? Yeah, exactly. In we can. Case? That was what I was also thinking. We can do the case presentation alone now and do the discussion after the topic. Sure. Dr. Pooja, will you be able to? Uh, uh, will, are you actively because I know Dr. Pooja had already intimated that she is also really feeling unwell. So I, uh, Dr. Pooja, if you could just give us a thumbs up so that we can share the screen and go ahead with reading the case. Uh, yes, she has uh, replied that we could go ahead. So okay. would you be happy to read or you want me to read uh, Shripriya, anything should be fine. What is the take? <laughs> Ma'am, I am a non-medical person. So I, I will go ahead. You just <laughs> share the screen and uh, I will a, go ahead. Okay. The screen is shared, ma'am. No, okay, yes. go on to I'll go on to the next page. Next slide, please. So the case that we are having here is uh, male patient with diagnosis of malignant bowel obstruction. Next one. The presenting complaints were feeling bloated and full since six months, pain usually colicky, tummy pain since four months, vomiting large amounts, including digested food or bowel fluid since four months, and also had a history of constipation for four months. Next slide, please. The history of illness. 56-year-old male patient presented with feeling bloated and full since six months, which was gradual in onset and then progressed. He also had pain in the abdomen, which was colicky for four months. And that was associated with vomiting large amounts and which was what mentioned undigested food. And as mentioned, constipation was also there. There was no history of any other trauma, infection or surgery. And he was... Uh, known hypertensive and diabetic for last eight years on medications. The medications were Losartan 25 milligrams and metformin. Losartan was OD and metformin B. Okay, next, general examination, what was found? Uh, patient is conscious, oriented, cooperative, no pallor ictus, ictus or cyanosis, no clubbing also, uh, no generalized lymphadenopathy or edema. BMI was 30.2. Vitals, pulse 88 per minute, blood pressure 130 by 90, and respiratory rate 21 per minute. Systemic examination were all normal. Local examination of the abdomen, probably. Inspection, distended abdomen, no visible scar or sinuses. Palpation, diffusely tender to touch. Percussion, tympanic sound uh, was there. And auscultation, hypoactive bowel sounds. Next one. Treatment and significant investigations. Complete lab 
investigations were complete blood count, serum electrolytes and amylase, and ABG. Radiological examination, plain X-ray of abdomen and CT scan. Next one. Psychosocial aspects. The patient is a 56 year old male running his own hotel business who spends greater part of the day outside. He is financially contributing member. He was the earning member of the family. Uh, the family included his wife and two children. Due to the pain, he was finding it difficult to work for long hours, which started, that was having impact on his work. He used to go out with his friends in the evening, which he had to stop due to abdominal discomfort. And that also affected his morale and social life. His quality of life at home was also affected as he had to rest for the remaining part of the day after work to recover from the pain. Overall, he faced severe discomfort and pain, which caused his productivity at workplace and home to decline. Next slide. What is medication? Patient was managed conservatively with IV fluids, nil per oral, bowel decompression through NG tube and antiemetics. Next one. What were the main concerns? The main concern was to ensure pain relief with conservative management and not letting the condition worsen, which could require a surgical management. The patient's quality of life and work was being affected, which began affecting him emotionally too. Patient was overweight, which was the risk factor for the condition. Comorbidities like hypertension and diabetes was also risk factors, which also needs to be maintained. Summary. A 56-year-old male patient presented with feeling bloated for six months, and was, which was gradual in onset and progressed later on. He also had pain in the abdomen, which was colicky and was associated with vomiting large amounts, and there was a history of constipation also. There was no other history of trauma, surgery, or infection. On examination, uh, his BMI was 30.2, and inspection showed distended abdomen with no visible scars in the abdomen, and the abdomen was tender to palpation and percussion note was tympanic. Auscultation revealed hypoactive bowel sounds. Due to the pain, he was finding it difficult to work for long hours, which started affecting his work. He used to go out with his friends in the evening. That also was not possible. And hence, all this affected his social life. His quality of life at home was also affected as he had to rest for the remaining part of the day other than his work, just for him to recover, to be able to go to work next day. Overall, he faced severe discomfort and pain, which caused his productivity to decline. He was treated conservatively with IV fluids, nil per oral, bowel decompression with NG tube and antiemetics. Conservative management has helped with me temporarily. Next one. The probable discussion points. How can severe persisting pain affect one's quality of life and emotional well-being? Can a patient's social life being affected add up to the already existing issue? Is surgical management safe and guarantee a better life than now? What other measures could have been taken in managing this patient? Okay, uh, just a couple of things with the, um, uh, go to the investigation and uh, investigation slide, uh, Sri Priya. Uh, and that, that, that one, uh, treatment and signal. Uh, just one query to Dr. Pooja. Um, top one, she's mentioned they were all normal. Radiological examination, plain X-ray and CT scan, what did that show? And what was his diet, malignant bubble obstruction, what was his uh, di primary diagnosis and um, staging or anything if known? Uh, Ma'am, the thing is, I don't have the reports. Uh, it showed bowel obstruction. It was a case of CA pancreas also. Uh, so CA pancreas, probably secondary. So what was uh, any that just because a little bit more uh, because things were not there in the slide. I just thought of uh, finding out. So, so this appeal, how long? Um, how long since diagnosis to this presentation and what treatment he had? Uh, 
uh, we, uh, the management was purely, uh, you know, uh, so system, uh, symptomatic Pall management. Palliative care management, that, that's understood from what you've mentioned. So was he aware of all that? Yeah, he was aware of that. And uh, it was like badly affecting his moods and his social life. And uh, he felt uh, kind of, you know, he's lost his life and nothing is there in his hands. That kind no, of no, like towards. management, what stage was, was it? Um, was he already in a stage which was like um, not correctable or something was like that? It was not like 56. that. Ah, because 56 year old you have mentioned no so yes. surgical management was actually possible but uh, mm. he and his family members were not actually willing for a surgical management because ah. they thought that uh, it will worsen the condition and they were not really trusting the thing mm. okay that because that may throw more light because a 56 year old we we had suggested that uh, surgery might improve whatever the condition he has and uh, um, and uh, to shift to uh, another you know uh, specialty care and stuff but uh, after surgery uh, but they were not willing for a surgery uh, he, they're they were, he just managed like that you know whatever mm. pain for med pain give medicines for pain and all that that's it mm. yes yes see that's where it comes no the patient's uh, autonomy does play a role we but at the same time our responsibility is to explain everything Yes. give them all the ways and means of how so we will go into the discussion when dr josna is also there after thing but uh, that initial yes, we have dr josna joining yes, yes. So then come on let's go back <laughs> uh, dr josna apologies like uh, since you to inform that you might get a few minutes late we thought we will just move ahead with the case presentation reading first and then discuss it later after your session yeah, yeah, that's completely okay. You can go ahead with the case presentation. We have done. Uh, warm welcome, Dr. Josna. We have uh, just uh, completed the, uh, uh, just uh, just done the uh, case presentation alone. Okay, warm welcome to you. Um, we are all, uh, we all had a lovely uh, opportunity and uh, enough information from you. So similarly, I would uh, welcome you once again um for our session today and uh, as all of us uh, all all our team members are aware you are you are from christian medical college Vellur, and you do a important role in the research faculty which is essential as i mentioned that is what will be a helping uh, aid to get improvement into palliative care okay uh, hopefully, you will en entire enlighten us more on the second aspect of the GI symptoms too. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for your kind uh, introduction. So, uh, may I share the screen? Yes, please go ahead. Is my screen visible to everyone? Yes, yes, we can. And am I audible clearly? Uh, yes, uh, today you are clear. So uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so today we'll try to have try to cover uh, an overview on uh, Hello, we can't hear her. Uh -huh. I was thinking it was on my end. Dr. Jolson? Maybe I said too early, maybe that she was clear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just we'll wait. Yes. Yeah, so, constipation is one of one of the most common distressing symptoms experienced by patients with serious illnesses. So uh, it occurs in at least 70% of patients with serious illnesses. Uh, in palliative care, the prevalence is around ranges from 40% to 90%. And as we all know, 
it in the prevalence increases with age uh, with polypharmacy and frailty uh despite of despite all these uh, definitions we all know that it's a subjective sensation subjective sy symptom and hence it is often unrecognized and untreated um uh, it is also, it's also associated with so many uh, other complications uh, and also higher rates of hospitalization and increased nursing hours so uh, actively uh, taking up measures to prevent screen for constipation and intervening early is crucial uh, so the fun so the normal uh, functionality so usually the colon absorbs fluids and transports uh, waste to the rectum through the repetitive and periodic contractions of peristalsis it is primarily mediated by uh, serotonin and then the sodium is actively reabsorbed through active transport channels water is absorbed through osmosis and this colonic secretion is also mediated through chlor chloride channels and there is a net reabsorption of electrolytes and fluids as they as it moves on and usually uh, and eventually the rectum distance and uh, this results in the urge to defecate this, this is also associated with contractions via the rectal sphincter so the average colonic transit time is about 20 to 72 hours and uh, constipation represents a disruption of these normal mechanisms so uh, it can be either functional constipation or a secondary constipation this is uh, the functional constipation can be a either a normal transit constipation, it can be because of a slow transit, or it could be due to defecatory or rectal evacuation disorders. Uh, constipation could also be secondary to various GI diseases like uh, IBS, diverticulosis, neurological or psychiatric diseases like uh, dementia and depression, other systemic diseases like diabetes and hypothyroidism. And uh, other than that, uh, always there is a drug induced etiology. So some drugs we'll see it later also some drugs like opioids and antacids especially in a palliative care setting uh, with relevance to opioids so uh, so some of the some of the causes it can be either organic uh, factors or functional factors it's almost a repetition of what we have seen earlier so some medications like opioids anticholinergic agents antiemetics uh, even even our iron tablets uh, some diuretics and even some chemotherapy agents might cause uh, constipation metabolic problems like dehydration, hypercalcemia, uh, uremia, neuromuscular disorders like myopathy, neurological disorders uh, like any uh, cerebral, cerebral or spinal cord dysfunction or autonomic dysfunction, uh, or it could be structural issues. It could be an abdominal or pelvic mass causing the symptom. It could be due to a radiation uh, related complication or peritoneal carcinomatosis. And uh, pain is also one of the contributory uh, causes for constipation like cancer pain, bone pain, and aorectal pain. Some of the, some of the functional factors include uh, intake of low fiber diet, anorexia, poor fluid, and food intake. Other than all these factors, um, there are there um, we will come across instances when patients just because of lack of privacy and they are admitted in a hospital setting. So all these environmental issues also matter. So they might need they might need assistance for toileting when they are admitted in the ward. So they'll have a lot of issues with privacy and they'll have some cultural issues. Other than that, apart from all these factors, uh, inactivity, age, uh, any sedation and depression are other contributory factors. So uh, Rome has put out a function a criteria for functional constipation. So this is the latest uh, criteria that is Rome for criteria. So functional constipation is a long definition so basically it should include two or more of the following like straining during more than uh, 25 percent of the defecations lumpy or hard stools more than one fourth of the defecations again sensation of incomplete evacuation sensation of anorectal obstruction or blockage and requirement of a manual maneuver to facilitate the process then fewer than fewer than three spontaneous bowel movements per week um, Loose tools are rarely present without the use of laxatives, and and when this doesn't meet the criteria for an irritable bowel syndrome, and for a this is usually a chronic symptom that they are mentioning because because they have also mentioned that the criteria should be fulfilled for the last three months with symptom onset at least six months prior to diagnosis. They also have come out with a, a set of definition for opioid induced constipation. So the prevalence of opioid induced constipation ranges from about forty percent to seventy percent. So new or worsening symptoms of constipation when initiating 
changing or increasing of your therapy and uh, the other criteria is almost like the same as the previous uh, functional constipation that we have seen so uh, 59 so this is a very good paper if uh, anybody is interested they can uh, learn more about the opioid induced constipation they have actually uh, uh, they have actually uh, written very beautifully about what mechanism what associated factors are or what pre predictive factors are there for opioid induced constipation so they found that 59% of the patients were having opioid induced constipation on clinical assessment 18.9% 18, 18 patients were assessed as not being constipated, but they were prescribed regular laxatives. And they also found out that uh, opioid induced constipation was not associated with demographic factors or uh, disease related factors or even the dose of opioid. But it was found to have a uh, association with the type of opioid that was prescribed. And the mechanism is, is basically uh, GIT, our gut has a lot of new receptors. So when opioids go and act there, uh, they cause the reduce reduction in peristalsis, uh, fluid secretion, increased fluid reabsorption, and also they also uh, cause constipation by increasing the sphincter tone. So coming to the assessment, so frequent regular assessment of bowel pattern is important to detect, detect improvements or deterioration in bowel patterns, regardless of whether or not patient is receiving a treatment. So always, uh, almost always, what is more important is we have to identify what is a normal bowel pattern of the, that particular patient and then individualize treatments rather than going as per a protocol. So some of the key factors uh, in assessment include uh, frequency of bowel movements, recent changes in bowel patterns, the consistency of the stool, uh, any, any history of incontinence, any history of evidence of blood or mucus in stools. Uh, uh, in other factors include patients eating and drinking habits what are the drugs prescribed what are the drugs the patient is on what is the level of physical activity uh, whether there are any other comorbidities and also the environmental factors that uh, we have mentioned earlier so examination again goes uh, a, a detailed examination like abdominal distension abdominal distension abdominal any mass present in the abdomen any tenderness in, um, then bowel sounds so these are all contributory to making a diagnosis on diagnosis of the cause of constipation. Again, a detailed perianal examination and a distal rectal examination, especially when there is a spinal cord injury, to make sure whether the sphincter is involved, the tone of the sphincter, whether there is any voluntary anal contraction. So all these are uh, all these are pointers which will help us in exactly identifying why the patient has constipation and helping helping us to manage properly. So investigations are not routinely necessary, especially in a palliative care setting. Uh, but some of the common uh, things that we have come across include hypercalcemia. It, it has been one of the presenting symptoms of a patient who on evaluation was found to have hypercalcemia. Uh, if anybody is interested in uh, taking up some research, which includes constipation as one of the symptoms, these are some of the tools that, that can uh, guide in uh, measuring the outcomes. So Bristol stool form scale, uh, there is a constipation assessment scale, uh, then bowel function index and bowel function diary. So these are some of the tools that can be used in a research setting. So uh, management, the best practice is based on a balance between strategies for prevention and self-care and prescribed oral and rectal laxative therapy. So uh, the management of a patient with constipation, especially in an oncological setting, it might differ when, when the patient is on oncological treatment and when the patient is only on palliative care. Also, we have to keep in mind any drug interactions. So these are some of the uh, preventive or self-care strategies which are equally important when, when we are seeing patients, especially when our nurses are educating the patients. So abdominal massage, uh, it has the most of the evidence uh, for abdominal massage in preventing or in management of constipation comes from the non-cancer population, like patients with Parkinsonian disease. Uh, in malignant uh, population, it doesn't. We don't have enough studies to uh, confidently say that it works. Other small measures include ensuring privacy and comfort to allow a patient to defecate normally, positioning to assist gravity, maybe uh, keeping a small food stool so that patient uh, is aided to exert pressure more easily, increasing the fluid intake, increasing activity, ambulation, 
and always when when you are prescribing opioid always remember that constipation is one side side effect uh, which the patients will not develop tolerance for so always anticipatory management of constipation wherever opioids are prescribed and also there will be so many over the counter products and home remedies which do not have so much evidence so educating the patients in this regard is also equally important now uh, the rationale for uh, pharmacological management of constipation so uh, we have to restore the amount of water in the feces by reducing the gi tract transit time maybe increasing the amount of water content and increasing the ability of the feces to retain water uh, another uh, important thing to consider is we have to improve the rectal evacuation by uh, promoting peristalsis or improving fecal consistency so these are some of the classes of laxatives so mainly in a, in an oncological setting or in a palliative care setting uh, fecal softeners stool softeners and uh, stimulant laxatives have uh, been found to have a role so stool softeners uh, include both osmotic laxatives and surface wetting agents so osmotic laxatives they will uh, the, so what happens is water will be retained in the gut lumen with the subsequent increase in the fecal volume so some of these common examples include lactulose again macrocols like uh, polyethylene glycol uh, surface wetting agents will have a detergent effect they will lower the surface tension that thereby allowing the water and fat to penetrate penetrate hard and dry feces uh, one of the example is in docosate sodium but there have been so many trials which uh, have come up uh, and now this is actually not recommended for the management uh, the other important category which uh, category of laxatives which we usually use in our clinical setting include stimulant laxatives some of the examples include senna bisacordyl and sodium picosulfate so what happens is these will act by a direct contact with the submucosal as well as the mind reflexes in the large bowel. So both the motility as well as the secretion is uh, affected. Other uh, classes of laxatives include bulk forming agents and lubricants. So in palliative care, to date, there is inadequate evidence to guide the optimal treatment of constipation with laxatives. So there is some evidence of benefit for uh, Bisacordyl, sodium picosulfate, and macrocols compared with placebo. So, uh, when you are prescribing laxative, you should always always understand the pathophysiology of constipation, mechanism mechanism of action of the laxatives, and the cost. Also, uh, important uh, thing is to consider the tolerability of the drug. Whether the patient, some patients might uh, might uh, tell that I am not able to tolerate this laxative. Uh, they might be uncomfortable with the taste, some people have some blotting sensation. So all these factors we will need to consider. Also avoid concurrent prescription of different laxatives, especially with the same mechanism. And uh, before changing to an alternative option, we can actually titrate the doses every one to, two, one to two days, if that is feasible, as per the response, and go up to the maximum recommended dose before changing the class of the laxative. And uh, usually it is uh, in palliative care settings, especially uh, with in the, in the context of oncology, it is reasonable to prescribe a stimulant laxative initially. After three to four days, if it is not effective, you can add a stool softener. And uh, this we will see even later also that in case of a colic, in, especially in patients with ma malignant bowel obstruction with complete obstruction and who are having colic. So we'll better avoid use of stimulant laxatives. So some of the rectal interventions, so about one third of the patients receiving palliative care need rectal measures. When either when the oral measures fail or when patient is completely bed bound with inadequate oral intake, very frail or patients who are having spinal cord injury. So rectal measures include suppositories and enemas, uh, especially when digital rectal uh, examination identifies a full rectum or fecal impaction. So this also uh, have almost the same mechanism as we saw previously with the oral laxatives, but they might work more quickly compared to oral, oral forms. So enemas are contraindicated in patients who are, are having neutropenia, thrombocytopenia in complete bubble obstruction, patients who have had a recent history of surgery, recent radiotherapy, active infection, trauma, all these things. So in case of a fecal impaction, which is also one of the causes of constipation, which is a very distressing thing, digital stool fragmentation followed by enema or suppository can facilitate the passage. 
So um, in opioid induced constipation, so unless contraindicated by pre-existing pre uh, diarrhea, so all patients, as we have already seen, all patients whom you are prescribing opioids should be prescribed a concomitant laxatives. So that is the thumb rule. So first line uh, includes either stimulant laxatives are usually preferred, or even osmotic laxatives in some settings. Uh, and in unresolved cases of opioid induced constipation, there are there is a class of drugs called peripherally acting new opioid receptor antagonist. So some of the examples include methyl, methyl naltrexone, nalox, naloxigol, and naldimidine. Uh, I don't think it is used in Indian settings. Maybe uh, ma'am can ma'am can uh, throw out some light on this, especially uh, if it is used in in the UK. So other approaches, these are also not uh, usually prescribed, but but these are also other options which can uh, which are available. So lubiprostone is a chloride channel activator. It also increases the secretion of ions and ions and water into the GIT. Has some role in uh, IBS and opioid induced constipation. So this is a very brief overview on constipation as a symptom as such. Because we have two topics, I've just limited to limited the content. So we'll also try to uh, cover some aspects of uh, malignant bowel obstruction. So uh, as all the symptoms and uh, syndromes, this also has a definition. So when there's a clinical evidence of bowel obstruction, via history, physical examination, uh, and radiographic examination, with the documented obstruction beyond the ligament of traits, in a patient who has intra-abdominal primary with incurable disease or non-intra-abdominal primary with the clear intraperitoneal disease. So this is either due to the cancer itself or as a consequence of anti-cancer therapy, which could be either due to surgery or chemotherapy agent or radiotherapy. So this is malignant bowel obstruction in short. So uh, when we are talking about anti-cancer treatments causing bowel obstruction, so post-surgery, it can be some adhesions, post-chemotherapy, there are chemotherapeutic agents uh, like uh, winged alkaloids, which can actually cause paralytic ileus. That's a functional type of a type of functional bowel obstruction. Radiotherapy, post-RT uh, adhesions or fibrosis could also lead to uh, malignant bowel obstruction. So this is a, sorry for this busy slide. But in general, this is the just to give you an overview of the epidemiology on malignant bowel obstruction. So, um, so the uh, global prevalence ranges from three percent to fifteen percent of all all patients with cancer. So, most commonly seen in patients with ovarian malignancy or other GI malignancies. The mean age of diagnosis, uh, we can I think we can skip that. The mean time from the initial diagnosis of cancer to uh, a malignant bowel obstruction could be like fourteen months. So the thing is, uh, in 22% of the patients, the first presentation could be a malignant bowel obstruction, first presentation of a malignancy. And 25% uh, of the patients with advanced cancer, they usually have had, uh, they might have had prior episodes. And uh, recurrence rate is also high, like almost 60%. So this, why this is important is because it is, it is, it is a uh, uh, indicator for poor prognosis, especially when it is inoperable. So there are intra-abdominal and extra-abdominal primaries which can lead to bowel obsession. We will not go into details of these. So some of the etiologies, again, uh, before that, we will classify the obstruction, malignant bowel obstruction. It can be either a uh, mechanical or a mechanical or a dynamic uh, obstruction or an adynamic because of some mortality disorders. So mechanical bowel obstruction can be either intrinsic or in, either due to an intrinsic uh, cause or an extrinsic cause. So intrinsic uh, etiologies include some intraluminal causes like some intraluminal uh, disease, annular narrowing, especially in, uh, in col colorectal cancers and all. Or it could be due to some disseminated disease. It could be due to polypoid lesions causing an intrinsic or intraluminal obstruction. It can even be intramural. Uh, by any any malignancy causing infiltration of the intestinal muscles or inflammation. Extrinsic uh, causes include an enlargement of a primary tumor causing extrinsic compression of the bowel. It can also be a post-surgical or post-radiotherapy fibrosis or adhesions causing extrinsic compression. <coughs> 
So bowel oxygen can also be partial, complete, uh, when it becomes a, it can also be strangulated, which is a complication of uh, bowel obstruction. Even according to the sites of obstruction, it can be either a small bowel obstruction or a large bowel obstruction. And when it becomes a closed loop, we call it as a closed loop obstruction. So uh, this terminology is also used uh, intermittently in uh, oncology settings, especially subacute intestinal obstruction. So this is uh, usually used when the obstruction is intermittent, incomplete, and recurrent. Uh, usually, a uh, patient will have some non-specific signs and symptoms, and usually, sometimes it responds to conservative treatments. So uh, it can also lead to delay in diagnosis and as well as uh, prompt treatment measures. So uh, going on to some, uh, going on to the basic pathophysiology. So this diagram. Uh, so this here, it, the, this is the point of obstruction from any extrinsic, intrinsic causes. Uh, so this proximal bowel, you can see that it is entirely dilated. The still bowel is collapsed. So proximally, what happens is all the secretions, all the contents of the bowel accumulates. So when when, when this fluid accumulates, there will be a little bit of distension of the bowel. Associated inflammation will be there, so this will again lead, increase, lead to increase in bowel edema. Uh, as the edema increases, there could be some necrotic changes. Fluid and air will accumulate. Bacterial overgrowth might occur. So this this is the thing that we see on erect uh, abdominal X-rays as air fluid levels. This entire process is associated with inflammation and the release of inflammatory inflammatory mediators as well. Um, and distally what happens is uh, even though the uh, distal bowel is collapsed the, the existing intraluminal contents might come out so patient might come up with history of uh, loose tools as well that can be actually spurious or paradoxical diarrhea but in turn the patient might have bowel obstruction so uh, this is also important because in order to treat the symptoms knowing this is equally important. So when there is a partial or complete interruption of the transit of bowel contents, what happens is, as we saw earlier, the luminal contents increase, there will be, a, uh, in, there will be an increase in the bowel distension. This can cause continuous abdominal pain. Once the bowel is distended, it can stimulate peristalsis. It can lead to increased bowel con contractions that patient can present with a colicky abdominal pain. Again, uh, this tension is also associ associated with damage of the epithelium and inflammatory response and production of all these mediators. Um, also, what happens is when there is an increase in the uh, luminal contents, the surface area of the gut epithelium will also increase. So there is increased secretion of fluids and electrolytes that can also cause nausea and vomiting. Other, uh, so this can in turn, this, these, all these secretions also increase that will in turn increase the bowel distension. So this is like, like a vicious cycle. So what happens is uh, when there is an obstruction and there is a stretching of bowel wall and distension that will in, in turn increase the fluids that are secreted and this goes on like a vicious cycle. So this uh, bowel obstruction is also associated with metabolic and septic consequences. So, uh, patient is at risk of developing dehydration, renal failure, uh, metabolic alkalosis, and dyselectrolytemia. So, all these things should be kept in mind when you are managing a patient with bowel obstruction. Um, so, the approach to the patient with managing bowel obstruction. So, clinical features will guide us along with the radiological features. Uh, to determine what the level of obstruction is. So, <clears throat> the higher the level of obstruction, the more the symptoms and fewer the signs. So, it, it is equally important to recognize this early, treat early, so that uh, the morbidity and the symptomatic symptom burden associated with this can be minimized. So, in patients with cancer, it usually uh, compression of the bowel lumen develops slowly and often remains partial. So, the symptoms will also depend whether it's a partial obstruction or a complete bowel obstruction. Even the management will differ if it's a partial bowel obstruction or a complete bowel obstruction. So this is a cl classic quartet of symptoms which patients will present to you with. So abdominal pain, abdominal distension, 
vomiting and obstipation. That is, patient won't be able to pass both, uh, if it's a complete obstruction, they won't be able to pass stools as well as flatus. So, uh, we need to find out clinically uh, where the level of obstruction is. So, uh, whether it's a small bowel obstruction or, the, or a large bowel obstruction or if it's a paralytic illness due to some other cause. So, colicky pain is usually, colicky pain, the pain, abdominal pain as such will be a more prominent symptom, especially in small bowel uh, obstruction. Um, and nausea vomiting again, more prominent with small bowel obstruction. Again, distension is an early feature in small bowel obstruction, but more in large bowel obstruction. Constipation and abdominal distension will be more prominent and more early in cases of large bowel obstruction. So on clinical examination, depending upon the patient's uh, fluid status, patient's dehydration, uh, all these will affect the, all, all these will determine the examination findings. So patient could be having signs of toxemia, patient could be having signs of uh, shock, um, dehydration. And if there is associated perforation or ischemia or systemic inflammation or even an abscess or a formed or contained perforation with superimposed infection or an abscess, patient will present to you with pyrexia. So abdominal examination as we saw earlier also, so usually abdomen might be distended. We have to uh, look for any visible peristalsis, especially when the obstruction is at the level, level of ileum. Uh, inspect all the hernia orifices, all surgical inc incisions. Um, uh, and on palpation, uh, it could be localized to start with, later it might become diffuse. And if it's a localized tenderness uh, associated with rebound tenderness or guarding or rigidity, it could be suggestive of an impending strangulation or perforation or a peritonitis either. And uh, a correct examination is very important uh, exam part of examination, especially when a patient is presenting to you with clinical symptoms of uh, bowel obstruction. Uh, bowel sounds on auscultation, yes, but the it cannot be like fully it cannot be. Um, told that these if bowel sounds are completely absent, it could be a complete bowel obstruction. So these are not very contributory to the diagnosis, especially when we have a, a radiological uh, investigations in place. So uh, um, as we have seen in that uh, case scenario also, so if if patient is dehydrated, if you are suspecting some features of infection, you can send a complete blood count. Again, a renal function test to see whether uh, there is elevated blood urea nitrogen. Uh, all the electrolytes and uh, coming to imaging. So, uh, especially abdominal radiographs are very simple investigatory measures that we can actually do, especially when in small settings. Uh, however, its sensitivity is only 66% and um, uh, the usefulness is actually still questionable. So, what we usually see in uh, abdominal x rays is the presence of air fruit levels, and there are some features which will which might help us to see whether it is a large bowel which is dilated or a small bowel which is dilated. So CT especially has a superior uh, result in the assessment of abdominal syndromes and it has a good sensitivity and specificity and accuracy. Um, so it is also useful when the patient is either not uh, received any oncological treatment, you have to diagnose, you have to make a proper diagnosis uh, assessing the extent of disease, perform a staging, and also to uh, make a choice whether the patient has to go ahead with a surgical procedure or or it should be a complete palliative intervention for the relief of obstruction. So coming briefly to the management. So uh, although it is usually associated with advanced stage disease, uh, when it occurs at the time of initial diagnosis, if it is like this is the upfront presentation of a patient with malignancy, Usually, initially, what the, uh, the oncologist will usually try to proceed with the curative intent. However, it is all, if it's a recurrent uh, disease and patient is already a non-case of cancer, usually the intent becomes often palliative. So, here, the in, uh, when considering the management, we have to see, uh, we have to balance life expectancy and the patient discomfort or suffering. So initial management measures will include all the fluid resuscitation, uh, management, correction of electrolyte, diselectrolytemia, uh, monitoring your and, and uh, all those general supportive measures. Uh, there has been, uh, so they have 
mentioned in most of the textbooks like there is bacterial translocation that also happens during the obstruction associated with proximal um, bowel loop dilatation and accumulation of secretions however the routine use of broad spectrum antibiotics in a case of uh, bowel obstruction we have only insufficient data so we cannot make any recommendations as of now um, sorry so uh, the some of so if the patient is having like severe vomiting and multiple episodes of vomiting we usually decompress the gut by the use of by the use of an esophagic tube as well <coughs> sorry so these are some of the surgical options we'll go to the conservative management after we we'll, after we go through the surgical options so uh, surgical options include complete resection any bypass procedures adhesiolysis creation of a diversion stoma or a combination of any of these so uh, so the procedure that is most likely to successfully relieve the symptoms for the greatest length of time with reasonable morbidity is chosen so if the patient is fit enough we will also see the contraindications and for the surgery later. So this is something which is important when we are considering whether the option has to be surgical or conservative. So, um, um, so, so, so if the obstruction doesn't improve usually if uh, after four to five days of decompression and if the patient's medical condition is fit, nutritional, nutritional status is okay, patient doesn't have malignant ascites and the life expectancy is at least more than two months and um, these are some of the factors that we should also consider if, uh, if you are going ahead with a surgical option but uh, there are some absolute contraindications like recurrent ascites diffuse palpable abdominal masses or even abundant caking in in peritoneal carcinomatosis if there are multiple levels of bowel obstruction uh, previous surgery showing diffuse metastatic or systemic metastatic cancer any recent abdominal surgery demonstrating that corrective surgery is technically impossible and involvement of the proximal stomach. These are some of the absolute contraindications. Other factors like poor nutritional status, uh, low serum albumin, multiple sites of intra-abdominal tumors, uh, extensive metastatic disease, and uh, if the patient has a very poor performance status or uh, uh, any organ dysfunction which is not uh, favoring surgery, uh, these factors also uh, come into play. So there are also endoscopic procedures like stenting for gastroduodenal and proximal jejunal obstruction. So this is best suited for patients with, with a short length of tumor, a single site of obstruction, etc. So um, the advantage is that a uh, patient has a quick, effective and shorter hospital stays. But later on, if the patient, uh, patient survival is long enough, they can even come back to us with stent related complications. Um, so, uh, stents are indicated when palliation, for palliation of surgically incurable colorectal cancers, especially in, in, especially in colorectal cancers, uh, who, or patients, in, patients when they are not willing to undergo a palliative resection procedure, um, as a, or as a bridge to surgery to avoid an emergency two-step procedure, so that for an interim period, patient's medical status can be optimized and then uh, further procedures can be done. So, um, yeah. so uh, NG tube decompression, uh, it is usually indicated and usually it is recommended that, especially in a palliative care setting, when it comes, it is only a temporary measure and only when patient has large volume vomitus, especially multiple episodes, like more than three episodes in 24 hours and large volume. And this is just a temporary decompressive measure. Uh, another option is vending percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy. This is also uh, another option when the patient has a desire. So some patients who are uh, who are um, eligible for this procedure and they have a complete bowel obstruction. They this they might be very they might be desiring to taste something, eat something that could be even one of the final wishes of that patient. So in such con such cases. A vending peg is one of the uh, available options that we we can actually discuss with the family and the relatives if if that if patient is fit enough for this procedure. Um, so coming to uh, conservative management, especially in the palliative care setting. So when there is a risk for poor surgical outcome, patient having ascites, uh, extensive peritoneal carcinomatosis, palpable intra-abdominal masses, multiple levels of obstruction. Uh, very advanced disease and poor performance status so uh, and 
in in another scenario when the patient is in the uh, in, in the face of a terminal illness and patient himself may wish no further interventions so that is when you have to think about a conservative management option so why we are discussing a lot of options here is that uh, some so we need to be aware of all the options so that we can we are the ones who are supposed to guide the family in choosing whichever is best for the patient so that's why we have to be aware of existing options that are available so that we may not so that we don't miss the uh, correct uh, pathway or correct option so uh, initial management we have already uh, gone through so if the obstetrician doesn't settle with the above measures like the conservative management measures so they will be in palliative care this is, this is uh, specific to palliative care setting so our aim is to relieve the patient's colicky pain patients having continuous abdominal pain so basically one is analgesia then to reduce vomiting to an acceptable level for the patient without the use of ngt because having an ngt is also equally distressing as having another symptom so most of the, recently itself we had a patient who, who was having complete malignant bowel obstruction she is, was not fit for any surgical interventions uh, only for palliative care uh, ideally she she's on an ng dependent drainage she was going home the only wish that only preference that she expressed was i don't want to continue ng so we have to try and reduce uh, nausea and vomiting to an acceptable or to such a level so that patient can actually continue whatever life expectancy they have without the use of an NGT if feasible. Uh, also to prevent, to permit sufficient oral fluids to maintain hydration. So oral route of administration will be unreliable. Patient is vomiting and patient have, has got obstruction. So parenteral route is the preferred route of choice. So it can be, so the preferred route of administration in palliative care include, uh, is mostly subcutaneous than an intravenous route. Um, and if the patient already has a pre-existing IV line, then you can continue that route. So other routes include some sublingual and transdermal routes for medications, especially analgesics. So specific drugs for symptom management. So um, uh, so for con so patient so as we saw in the previous uh, schematic diagram when we discussed the mechanism, so patient will have uh, both continuous pain because of the bowel distension as well as colicky pain because of the intermittent contractions or the peristalsis that happens proximally so we have to tackle both both types of pain. so uh, uh, for constant background pain opioids opioid analytics given via a subcutaneous route or a transdermal route or a uh, sublingual route these are recommended so um, and for the colicky component of the pain usually anticholinergics uh, especially anticholinergics like uh, hyosin butyl bromide are recommended for nausea and vomiting, so always we have to remember whether uh, to identify whether it's a complete obstruction or a partial bowel obstruction. If it is a partial bowel obstruction, our aim is to get the bowel, get the bowel moving. So prokinetics play a very important role in partial bowel obstruction. However, if it's a complete bowel obstruction and the patient is having a colic, uh, we have to avoid the use of prokinetics like metoclopramide. So if no colic, the first line, if it's a partial obstruction, you can go ahead with metoclopramide down the block. If the patient is having associated colic, you have to stop the metoclopramide. Better use uh, an anticholinergic. And for uh, nausea and vomiting, nausea and vomiting, we have already seen in the last class, uh, we have had a detailed discussion. So uh, use of haloperitol is uh, usually recommended if there are no other contraindications. So if the patient, so patient is already on NG, usually the patient will be on NG dependent drainage if the patient is having large volume vomitors and multiple episodes of vomiting. So in such cases, if the NG drainage is like, uh, the volume is huge, octreotide can help. That can help in reducing the amount of uh, secretions, intestinal and GI secretions. Um, so it can even, it can actually reduce the volume, it can help in reducing the volume of uh, the drainage and help us in um, reducing the length of time when the patient will be on an NG dependent drainage. Or uh, another, so regarding dexamethasone, we'll see it later also. Um, so this, I think we've already covered in nausea and vomiting, so I'm not going to the individual drugs. So uh, usual doses recommended for uh, hyosin butyl bromide, which is the usual anticholinergic used for uh, colicky pain. It also has an anti-secretory effect. 
so it can also reduce help in reducing the nausea and vomiting uh, so the usual recommended doses are 60 to 120 mg in 24 hours with the prn dose of 20 mg every one hour um haloperidol is it's a potent B2 antagonist and uh, in complete bowel obstruction, this is the anti emetic drug of first choice. So what is the role of uh, corticosteroids in mechanical bowel obstruction? So uh, steroids basically what they do is they will help in reducing the inflammation. So as we have seen in the earlier uh, diagram, when there is obstruction proximally and at the site of obstruction, there's a lot of distinction, inflammation, release of inflammatory mediators. So anti-inflammatory action of corticosteroids will help in uh increasing help in reducing the inflammation thereby increasing the lumen of the obstructed viscous it also has an anti-emetic action also an anti-secretory effect as well so um we don't have uh, very high quality evidence to say that it will work uh it, we only have a trend for evidence of steroids so the the uh, range uh, the, those ranges from six milligram to 16 milligrams in 24 hours so um uh so usually we give a short trial of corticosteroids like dexamethasone maybe six milligram per day so give a short trial of five days and then stop so if so only a short therapeutic trial of dexamethasone can be done and in most of the cases uh, it has actually helped in reduction of bowel edema and it has actually helped in getting the bowel moving but to a temporary a temporary extent when the patient has an advanced disease Again, uh, this proton pump inhibitors and H2 blockers like ran, like uh, ranitidine and all. Again, because of the anti-secretory action, the patient has a, the, the gut is again producing all the secretions which are again accumulating and increasing the distension. So uh, these drugs also have a role. So octreotide we have already seen. Uh, so it is a somatostatin analog. It inhibits the secretion of all these uh, mediators and also reduces this plasmic blood flow and portal blood flow. Uh, also helps in increasing the absorption of water and electrolytes at intracellular level. Uh, so it has anti-secretory, anti-emetic, and it also helps in reducing the bowel distension. So uh, usual recommended doses are like around 500, 500 micrograms in 24 hours and maximum is around 800 micrograms in 24 hours. Um, however, we don't have a lot of evidence to say that octreotide is very beneficial. So there has been an art, there has been a large uh, randomized control trial where they actually compared the uh, vomiting three days instead of frequency of vomiting. So they could not find out uh, so much or significant difference uh, when octreotide was added along with the other management measures. Uh, <clears throat> So if vomiting persists, I'll always review the patient's oral intake and uh, in partial, if it's a partial obstruction, uh, we can actually give some uh, stool softness also if it's, a, if it's a partial bowel obstruction. So the most important question that families will come up when the patient is having obstruction is about nutrition because uh, eating or taking food or nutrition is, 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 uh, is one of the uh, are, uh, one of the things which our lives revolve around. So uh, the most important consequence of a bowel obstruction is the disruption of the ability to eat normally. So this will also add to a lot of psychological distress in a patient with malignant bowel obstruction. So uh, they won't be able to attend any functions. They won't be able to maintain uh, their social relationships or ties. And it's a significant source of distress to both patients as well as, as, well as the family members. So family members will come to you asking, uh, because we have kept the patient ill or the patient is not getting enough nutrition, want the patient uh, even die of not giving food. We have had patients relatives asking these questions as well. So in patients with advanced cancer, cataxia is also another, uh, another, another component along with malignant bowel obstruction. So it's also difficult to identify uh, when they are asking if the weight loss can be reversed, if obstruction is relieved and all that's another, another point altogether. So, uh, so even uh, even your colleagues like surgical oncologists might come up and they might even families might even request for some artificial means of nutrition. However, in patients with uh, inoperable and malignant bowel obstruction, in patients with advanced cancer, we don't have any uh, evidence to say that parental nutrition, like total parental nutrition at home or hospital, helps. So whatever we don't we are not certain we don't have good evidence to tell that it will work 
so we can even individualize the uh, treatment plans educate the patients and caregivers that and, and reassure to them that it is not because of the uh, nutrition that the patient is patient is uh, having this condition so educating multiple times reaffirming and reassuring them it becomes a, a very important role when communicating uh, communicating with the with the family of a patient with malignant bowel obstruction so these are some of the um, uh, Artificial hydration uh, in this context, artificial hydration can actually be com continued uh, depending upon the output and depending upon the uh, patient's um, uh, practical situations. So we can we we usually uh, recommend subcutaneous fluids and all even that can be taught to the relatives uh, that can be continued at home as well. Uh, some of the prognos uh, some of the factors which will help in prognostication in malignant bowel obstruction include the uh, serum albumin levels, the performance state of the patient, presence of ascites, peritoneal carcinomatosis, uh, metastasis outside the abdominal cavity, which is a completely disseminated disease, or a patient who has multiple and uh, recurrent episodes of bowel obstruction in a short while. So uh, we don't have specific tools to prognosticate uh, MBO. This is one tool which is also not very commonly used, but this is a very this is a paper which was published I think in 1980s or something. Uh, so they have come up with the prognostic index called Krebs and Joperol prognostic index. This also includes the same factors that we discussed earlier. So uh, uh, we are actually short of time. So I have just uh, uh, compressed the entire contents. So thank you so much for your patient listening. Do you have any queries, comments? Thank you, Dr. Josna. It is uh, an extensive uh, topic, isn't it? And um, because, um, and you have brought out uh, the like pathophysiology and things, how it happens, and also given uh, sufficient information on management per se, which is more equally important when people, when uh, like uh, patients and family with their main concern do approach. And uh, as clearly mentioned no like we have to explain to them in detail that just by giving whatever nutrition or thing that they are anticipating that is not going to correct the correctable okay is that going to change the obstruction and solve or relieve then 200 percent we will do so uh, it in the biggest challenge will be to explain to them and then uh, give them other options, identifying the level of obstruction and going ahead with the management, what will be appropriate. And um, I, like when we go ahead with the case also, that's what um, has been brought up also, which we have just done the thing and we will go ahead. And um, one thing what uh, you had mentioned about um, opioid antagonists for uh, being used for um, constipation and things, not widely used uh, from what I have uh, seen in the last 10, 15 years. Only thing is that even when very rarely used for like pruritus and things also, but the important thing to remember there is it will take away the um, beneficial effect of the opioid also. That also has to be borne in mind. So that is one thing which we will always consider even when you're thinking of it, to warn and tell them when you start using this, you may lose the uh, pain relief benefit and thing. So that's where, and then uh, in that on, on the only thing is, um, so that's why not widely used. So that was the query with the uh, thing which you had mentioned, uh, which I wanted to update. And let me see what are the um, queries in the chat box. Uh, continuous subcutaneous infusion, what is the role? You want to go ahead, Josna, then uh, I can add on if anything yeah. needs. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so, uh, I, I do not understand. If, if it's a continuous subcutaneous infusion of any drug or fluids? That no, no. Flu uh, I thought it should be fluids should have been the query if that will help. 
Yeah, that's what, right. that's what I mentioned about artificial uh, that's hydration. Also, so let's see oh, who had asked. Yeah, that's what I mentioned about artificial hydration. So, if, uh, if, if the patient, is only their answer. Okay. The uh, thing managed at home, if the patient preferred place of care is home, mm. um, what we usually do is we, from the hospital, we put a subcute line and teach the relatives and then we send home. We don't use, usually, uh, we also, uh, respect the patient's comfort levels. It's not like a 24 hours infusion that we give. Maybe during the daytime, um, we can give some amount of fluids sub-Q, but we, uh, our nurses do a wonderful role in that. They actually teach the caregivers how to manage that at home. And uh, also if possible, continuing the care, continuing the care at home, like by providing some home visit, if possible, if the patient is near your hospital, um, you can continue to visit the patient at home and see how the patient is doing. We have to also, it's like a very thin line. We have to make sure that the patient is not getting over hydrated and not getting any side effects of a fluid overload. At the same time, the patient is getting a little bit of hydration as well. So it's like a very judiciously you have to do it. And it and as, as you mentioned, it's a conservative and palliative uh, management only. That has to be clear. See, intravenous uh, IV management and subcutaneous are they are not going to be equal. Uh, the thing is that for pay, uh, for uh, sat sat patient satisfaction, family satisfaction and things. And if, again, to convince them to get to a stage where if it is not going to be helpful, it, we have to do that at one stage. As mentioned, it's a very fine line. You have to explain and see if it is really beneficial. And you should not do any harm also. Okay, so and then the family has to be taught. And in this, again, the nurses do a very, very important role. They have to teach the family how it has to be seen and any uh, side effects to be picked up. And then uh, they, they have to be some first awareness and then you have to teach them. First, they should not be scared also. So many, many elements are there. You have to prime them, I would say, to get to a stage to that. And your nursing team is what plays a bigger role, not only starting it, doing some visit and giving assurance to them that someone will come and see them. Only if those facilities are there, you go ahead with that. And like anything else is there or um, we can go ahead with the... Uh, Case discussion also. How far is the rectal root effective? Rectal root for uh, uh, relief or uh, what was the question? How far is the rectal root effective for malignant bowel obstruction? Is it like, are you asking like um, enema and uh, things? I think uh, I am not fully clear of the question, but if the patient is uh, coming from such a background, for conservative man for management purpose. Yeah. Uh, okay. So mm -hmm. when the patient is uh, not able to continue any parenteral or not able to, they are not able to give any injectables at wherever they are, like at home and all. And if if any transdermal sublingual measures are not available for analgesia or for fever. That is one route that's available, but I haven't used uh, any rectal route of medicines for pain management or for, for, for pain management specifically. But if the patient has uh, got some fecal impaction, you can try some some uh, glycerin suppositories or some enema if the patient is not having any complete bowel obstruction. Otherwise, I'm not very much aware of rectal interventions. Ma'am, uh, could you add some points? See, rectal, you can use rectal for even pain relief. See, paracetamol, diclofenac, everything suppositories will be helpful. In rectal route, one important thing is, uh, again, the patient or the um, uh, carer has to be taught how to use it. See, just placing it 
in the middle of the rectum will not do anything. See, for pain relief also, we do instruct and ask them paracetamol, a gram of paracetamol or uh, 50 or 100 milligrams diclofenac suppositories are available, which can be used. But teaching them and educating them to place the suppository in such a way that it touches the side of the rectum. You just, for example, I'll just show you. If this is the rectum, if you just place the suppository like this, it will not even work. Okay. So if it is like this, it has to touch the side of the rectal wall. That is something we, all nurses will teach them. So that is how you have to play. It has to touch the, sub, the mucosa. Only then it will work. So that is answering the question. One will be use of suppositories for pain relief can be used. But if it, for the treatment of the obstruction per se, if that was the thing, then it depends on the diagnosis of the obstruction. So only then. If it is partial obstruction, it might work. If it is total obstruction, you would not uh, recommend that to be done. Uh, anything else you want to add on, Jyotsna? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Thank you. Mm. So that is what it is. So only thing, as I mentioned, this uh, teaching them and telling them how to place the suppository is something important, which I also was having in mind to bring that up and good this came up. Because... If, 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 for example, if it's an impact, even for your um, suppositories for uh, like, before you go ahead uh, with an email, if you want to try something, the placing the suppository has to be done properly and we have to uh, teach them how to do it. And similarly for um, pain relief, I, I have used a lot of um, suppositories for pain relief. See, in pediatric practice, you even in anesthesia, we used to use. For example, in children, when we finish, we will add that on because children may not, may not be comfortable eating, drinking afterwards, immediately having a pain painkiller or something. So there also uh, I have used a lot. And even in palliative care, pain relief, sometimes no, when they can't, they, they may be getting, they can't eat, drink, or do swallowing difficulty. So they may be getting a patch, but that may not be sufficient. And always with pain, no, it could be multifactorial. So in those type of situations, I have used along with um, like a one-off, even a one-off uh, diclofenac, which may not be seen. Those NSAs, if they're used long-term, they have more uh, unwanted side effects. When it used is used as a one-off thing, it may yeah, give the better. So those are things, uh, rectal suppositories will work and do work as a supplement. So we can go ahead with the uh, case. Um, we have, uh, Jyotsna, we have read about, read the whole um, case. So if anyone wants to uh, ask questions about that also, you can go ahead. Because we just did the case presentation. We have not done the... Um, discussion of it. Uh, Sri Priya, if you could go to the main concern uh, slide, Sri Priya, that will be good. Yeah. Okay, so the main concern was to ensure pain relief with conservative management and not letting the condition worsen, which could require a surgical management. See, um, this one, no, as she mentioned that um, the patient was not willing for any surgical correction, it seems. So that was the reason why, because I, before you joined us, uh, Josna, I was just asking because the diagnosis CT scan information was not there. So yeah. she mentioned that um, it was a pancreatic uh, malignancy. And uh, the patient and family were not keen on going ahead with any surgical correction. So, what what were all like? What were all the pain relief medications given, Doctor Poja? Was the patient comfortable enough? Yes, ma'am. The patient had an on and off pain, which was mm -hmm. like symptomatically managed with uh, painkillers and all that. Uh, mm -hmm. 
nothing characteristically specific for the thing was done uh, they were like a very um, a skeptical about surgical side and they wanted hmm. to opt for ayurveda treatment and all that they were you know okay so the pain was not uh, like what to say he was coping and working you said that's what was the history isn't it even though it was impeding on his work he was mad so what would you say pain scored from what to what did it come down any any information on that no ma'am okay no problem so go back uh, to that main concern itself shri priya Hello, can we go to the main concern? Yes. Ah, okay, the next is the patient's quality of life and work has, was being affected, which began affecting him emotionally. Too. Naturally, see, that is where this total pain will come into picture. Always, I, I do tell, when your mood is low, pain is high. There's a strong wrong link between mood and pain. so this has been proven again all chemical uh, mediators in the brain and things they have uh, done quite lot of studies and given evidence that that is how it is and also this fmri studies and things show that when someone is emotionally upset their pain level is very high so it will affect emotion and pain have a wrong strong link okay and then uh, weight risk factor weight is a general risk factor some people like about it some people don't like so that is um, yes it does have because even from that from a, um, like a medical point of view this visceral fat is something which can cause enough harm and impede the functioning so that is what has to be explained from weight point of view uh, jochna you can add on whatever uh, more you want to add on and then uh, uh, we will go ahead with the rest dear okay ma'am uh, so uh, so when you get a patient like this so understand what the diagnosis is what the stage and extent of the disease is then uh, find out whether it's a complete bowel obstruction or a partial bowel obstruction like this is one thing that you can easily keep in mind uh, whether it is operable or inoperable along with all these things consider the prognosis of the patient so if it's a pancreatic malignancy with peritoneal disease it the prognosis is going to be poor anyway so in, at in along with these things uh, explore what the patient's preferences are patient what the patient wants what the family wants uh, set a goal of set some goals of care at at that uh, point of discussion and then if the goals of care like the the clinicians patients value and then it's a, it's a it's a shared decision making that we have to do especially when a patient is having a poor prognosis and a short survival so at that point make a shared decision in the best interest of the patient if the patient doesn't want to go ahead with any surgical intervention like this then uh, the the only most likely option is only conservative management because if the patient is already having active bowel obstruction he won't be fit, fit for fit for any other oncology intervention we cannot treat further in a patient with active obstruction so uh, equally important is we have to be we have to continue the support continue supporting the patient family both pharmacological measures non pharmacological measures as well as through constant uh, psychosocial psychological and uh, emotional support because malignant bowel obstruction is like like i don't know it's like a worst nightmare that can happen to a person not it being not able to eat so the distress transfers from the patient to the caregiver and it becomes like uh, it becomes an exponential distress when they come to hospital they are all distressed like anyway so continuing the care continuing uh, symptom control measures along with constant providing a constant support for the patient and family throughout also equally important is even if we are able to temporarily manage or temporarily get the bowel moving always we have to tell the relatives inform them that because the disease is like this is persistent 
there is a possibility that the same episode can recur in a few days or maybe the next day or in a few weeks so it's like a continuum of care uh, that we have to actually provide uh, this is what i want to add so basically understand the diagnosis whether it's operable inoperable complete or partial if it is an inoperable bowel obstruction or the patient doesn't want surgery consider the prognosis also keep into account patients preferences patients values what the family's things uh, document the goals of care at that moment and then provide a continuous or continuum of care till the patient receives adequate symptom control along with with the with the layer of psychosocial support this is what um, we can we can do i think this is what i want to add thank you excellent dear e- exactly such a methodical way you have said basically first rule out what it is and then comes as you said an autonomy of the patient if that is what the patient wants yes explain and then we will do always something in the best interest of the patient okay and then explaining it as she mentioned it will be from patient to family family to patient both many times what they'll have it will happen is because they want to love and care for the patient they'll force so but you have to be there for both the patient and the carer so you have to explain to them that by forcing it's going to cause more harm for him so you don't want that so these type of explanations and continuum of care and relieving all the additional symptoms which can be relieved okay some correct the correctable okay you cannot correct then what can you do for the rest of the symptoms is that of main interest there and so getting psychological social support all that is very important what is that the patient wants do that and then make sure you give confidence to them that someone will be there to hear to whatever their queries are and next, last thing what you mentioned about diabetes and hypertension you just have to see these two things no when the patient is not eating drinking and uh, uh, everything is there you have to do a tight rope thing you have to really see how much is needed what is needed if patient is not eating at all no point giving anti diabetic it will only push them more to hypoglycemia so those two things have to be managed appropriately that's the only thing i just want to add on and as she has mentioned it should be a methodical continuous care and uh, giving them the support and confidence and treating whatever symptoms which can be treated i think with that we we have covered uh, most of the things anybody wants to ask anything more or anything please do unmute and ask or type in the chat either way is fine If no more queries i think in that case we have covered everything anything else you want to add on jyotsna please do uh no ma'am nothing but uh, just a concluding comment uh, so if uh, if you are able to uh, with your palliative interventions if you are actually able to you know bring down the suffering of a patient with malign bowel obstruction that is some that's a rewarding experience of working in palliative care so uh, <laughs> so like maybe it's for only a temporary while that we are able to relieve those symptoms maybe that maybe this will come back again but for a temporary while if you are able to keep the symptoms in control if it's a partial bowel obstruction if you are able to get the bowel moving that patient uh, will be very grateful to you so that's it yeah thank you that's that's the uh, work satisfaction that you get isn't it that minute that that that, that is what um, Uh, like in reality what you get yes ma'am being for them that is what it is yeah okay then sri priya i think uh, nothing more in the chat box anything that i think we have cleared all yeah, what was good to close well in time uh-huh. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Josna, for joining us and taking us through the 
GI symptoms uh, very extensively. Thank you so much for that. And uh, thank you everyone for joining in and making this session interactive. So uh, see you in the next session next Monday with another interesting topic and yet another remaining faculty. Till then, this is Sri Priya along with Dr. Josna, Dr. Radha and Mr. Anup signing off from the Tipsy Co-Hub. See you in the next session. Till then, everyone take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.